When faced with the inevitable difficult decisions, burnout, or the need for guidance, having a set of practices or principles to fall back on can be invaluable. They can remind us of what's important, offer us a tried and true way of looking at a problem anew, or just give us reassurance that we're on the right path. This book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World by Acumen founder and CEO Jacqueline Novogratz, might be able to help. She wrote this book for the change maker. She wrote it for those of us who feel both frustrated with the state of the world, but still hopeful and hungry to take action. It's first a call to action, making the case that what the world needs most right now is a shift in our moral calculus, what Novogratz calls a moral revolution, a shift from what's in it for me to what can I do for others. Novogratz's manifesto offers a set of practices that she's been able to observe, extract, and articulate from a career of building a better world. And in this read ensemble video, I'll summarize each of the 13 practices she shared, as well as some of my own takeaways, so that you and I might be able to join in this moral revolution ourselves. And if you'd like to get a copy of this book yourself, support smaller booksellers, and turn to folks like bookshop.org, Better World Books, or of course, your own local indie bookstore. Practice number one, just start. Jacqueline interacts with young, ambitious people all over the globe who want to make a change. She's often met with the questions, how can I be of use? How can I find my purpose? Or where will I make the most impact? Her advice here, fittingly, is just start. There's no plan, strategy, or thinking that will have you uncover your purpose. You do so by taking action. You take action, you learn, you take action, you learn again and again and again. As she says, you don't plan your way into finding your purpose. You live into your purpose one step at a time. Fear must become irrelevant because it's inevitable. She says that to rule out failure is to rule out success. Your skill set, know-how, and network are all valuable assets in your effort to, to make an impact, but Jacqueline believes those aren't the most valuable. What's most valuable is stamina. The ability, as Jacqueline describes, to start over and over and over, really just hanging around. <laughs> Think less about what the perfect next step is and just take one. Imitate others who inspire you and gain from their experiences and lessons. Easier said than done, but be patient to determine what your purpose is, but be tenacious in taking action. She also reminds us that it took her 20 years to manifest acumen. Practice number two, redefine success. Jacqueline believes our economic systems, as they are, breed a zero-sum culture of success. It's about what's taken, not given. It's about winning the money, power, or fame game. We're celebrated for what we might contribute to the economy versus what we might contribute to the world. Jacqueline points out that what matters most is overlooked in the conventional definition of success. She writes that laughter, respect, the security of productive work, a sense of belonging, dignity, these are all things that matter the most to our experience as human beings, yet our financial and economic systems too often fail to acknowledge them when calculating success. This is critically important to remember. Things that can't be bought and sold can be infinitely more valuable than anything with an attached price tag. While the current political, economic, and social systems perpetuates a culture of individual gain, money is the only metric of value, we must remember that people, us, make up those systems. And so, Jacqueline goes further. We have the opportunity to rebuild the systems and redefine the important beliefs behind success. We can choose to reject the things that no longer serve, she says. We can choose collaboration over competition, contribution over accumulation, humanity before the economy. But she offers a word of caution. Going against the status quo might have you meet resistance. Some systems, groups, and organizations might still demand conventional success for you to participate. Have you ever tried to buy a house? Don't let that resistance encourage you to quit. Let that resistance remind you just how important it is that you do what you do and believe what you believe. Then, Refer back to practice number one and start again. Practice number three, cultivate moral imagination. This might be Jacqueline's cornerstone term. She believes that moral imagination is the linchpin to creating solutions to the world's problems that are truly sustainable, equitable, and just. She says moral imagination means to view other people's problems as if they were your own and to begin to discern how to tackle those problems and then act accordingly. Moral imagination feels to me not just practicing empathy, but also immersion. You mustn't just 
attempt to empathize with those you wish to serve. You must attempt to immerse yourself in their experience. Get close to the problem. Get close to the people you hope to serve. Ask them what they need. Don't assume. They'll have the answers for you. From there, moral imagination calls you to action. Start at empathy and immersion and then move to action. We must be extremely cautious to offer solutions to the problems of other communities that are outside of our own. We can't assume we know what's best. We can't assume what we have is what other people want. We can't build and maintain a solution to a problem we don't have intimate familiarity with. Practice number four, listen to voices unheard. It's easy to forget that our efforts to solve the world's problems aren't about us. We have to remember who we're serving. The key word here is serving. The conventional systems might have worked well for us. That doesn't mean we can anticipate the needs and desires of those the systems have excluded. We have to listen. As Jacqueline tells us, we have to listen fully and completely. While many have had good intents, those who have historically worked to serve the poorest among us haven't invited those communities into the conversation around the solutions. And so many of the solutions created haven't solved the right problems or haven't served the people most severely affected by those problems. In many of the worst cases, the poorest have been left with more precarious positions than before. If we're to serve those whose systems have historically failed or excluded, as Jacqueline explains, then we have to let them lead in the solutions to the problems that they know best. They are the ones experiencing them. Don't assume you know. Instead, ask questions. Then listen. Listen with the entirety of your attention. And she eloquently reminds us we miss so much by assuming we have the answers. Practice number five. You are the ocean in a drop. If we are to come together subscribing to a revolution of morals, as Jacqueline puts it, it's critical that we can both acknowledge and honor the various identities in others while at the same time grasp firmly to our common ground that is our shared humanity. As she says, we aren't a drop in the ocean, but rather the entire ocean in a single drop. Our shared humanity is strong and vast enough to encompass our beautiful diversity, she writes. Her advice? With a career's worth of experience working with people from a vast collection of backgrounds, work to know yourself. Then be open to the multiple identities others might possess. Finally, the person or the group with the greater power in any moment must extend their effort and attention to understand the experience and knowledge of those with less power. Develop self-awareness and be open to who others are, then extend yourself to achieve shared understanding where appropriate and necessary. Practice number six, practice courage. Jacqueline believes that the courageous are rewarded. Life could be a great adventure if you were willing to dare, she says, but how do we become courageous? We practice. Jacqueline sees that courage is a muscle. The more we exercise it, even in small ways, the more courageous we become. And so, like any muscle, any skill, we can build our courage through habit. Do something courageous every day. Jacqueline challenges us to regularly ask ourselves, what is the cost of not daring? What is the cost of not trying? What is the cost of not speaking up? She tells us fear is just a cue for when we might get a chance to build this muscle. The more we practice being courageous, attentive to those cues, the more likely we'll be prepared when we in the world need courage most. Practice number seven, hold opposing values in tension. For a moral revolution to manifest, we must shift from right or wrong, either or thinking to both and thinking. Jacqueline says we need to acknowledge the truths that exist in opposing perspectives. It's not about being right. It's about understanding. It's about our shared objectives and shared goals. It's about collective flourishing. Jacqueline urges us to dare to recognize the uneasy truths that live far, far apart. A path forward won't be strictly one way or the other. A sustainable path forward will have to hold contradictions and seemingly opposing values and perspectives together. Practice eight, avoid the conformity trap. That's just how the world works. Well, it doesn't have to be. We're all too familiar with hearing that phrase, implicitly telling us we're too idealistic, we're too naive, we don't understand reality. Jacqueline calls us to be vigilant for when a common narrative muffles our conscience. We can easily conform to the beliefs about how things must be done. We can easily conform to the beliefs that certain things can or cannot be done at all. Just the way it is, is only as such for as long as we let it. Jacqueline reminds us conformity can be subtle. No matter how determined we are to do the right thing, we all fall prey to conformity traps within the system we've chosen. You'll find the subtlety a lot 
within the wide spectrum of sustainable business, for example. Some businesses market change and others commit to changing business as their mission. The goal of changing business for the better is to create economies that are more humane and to reset the expectation that business is meant to serve people, not the other way around. If the business community puts on a sustainable face, but still puts profit above everything else, as has been the case, we might feel a little bit better, but real change is limited. If, on the other hand, we reimagine business with the impacts on people and the planet truly above profits, only then might we change the whole system for the better. As Jacqueline writes, we must be attentive to the nuances of conformity that exist wherever we are. And I think she says it beautifully as she wrote, in creating more just, inclusive, and sustainable systems, the means, not solely the ends, matter. You make change when you model change. Practice nine, use the power of markets, but don't be seduced by them. Jacqueline believes that markets are one of the most powerful forces we have at our disposal for solving the world's problems. The key, she says, is to remember that markets are a tool, and to that point, an imperfect tool. It's imperative that we remain committed to the goal of changing the world for the better, not short-term profit-making. Markets, as Jacqueline explains, can be an effective listening tool. They can offer us insight into what people value and what they can afford. But markets must be wielded with restraint. She reminds us that our current economic system is limited to focusing on what we can count. It's not necessarily focused on what we value most or what might be what makes for a healthy and happy global citizenry. To reimagine our relationship to markets, she says, it begins with redetermining their purpose. Do we build and use markets to make the most people better off? Or do we build and use markets to create the most amount of wealth possible? These goals won't lead to the same outcomes. Use the tools that are available to us, but remember what you're using them for. Finally, not everything is a nail. Sometimes a hammer just isn't the best tool for the job. Practice 10, partner with humility and audacity. Jacqueline shares a clear and firm message. If you wanna create or renew systems, small is beautiful, but scale is critical. She says that to create systems change, you'll have to go big. And by going big, she explains you'll need to partner with folks in every part of the ecosystem you're operating in. Government, nonprofits, community members, investors, business partners. Tackling our world's problems requires everyone. You cannot make change alone. Building effective partnerships is crucial. To build strong partners, she advises to first come back to your purpose. What are you hoping to achieve and what do you have to bring to the conversation? Resources, advantages, skills. By understanding this, you'll be able to better understand what partners might or might not be a fit. She encourages us to be honest and open in our efforts to build partnerships, but at the same time, be cautious and protective of our values and our mission. Do your due diligence. Some partners that seem good will fail, just like unexpected partnerships might end up proving the most fruitful and fulfilling. Ensure everyone is involved for the right reasons. Practice number 11, accompany each other. Jacqueline introduces us to the Jesuit idea of accompaniment, which means to live and walk alongside those you serve. Accompaniment is about repeatedly showing up. It's about raising others up, being slow to ever put your own own competence or intelligence on display. She says the opposite of accompaniment is separation. It's about systems that separate us from suffering, that reduce tragedies and people to statistics, that, for example, in the business conversation, reduce people or labor to costs of goods sold. To think about how we can incorporate accompaniment as a practice of our own, Jacqueline suggests we think about the parents, mentors, teachers, and friends who believed in us in the past. It's these people, she explains, who have accompanied us in our own lives. And it becomes our duty to return the favor for someone else. Human beings thrive when we believe someone cares about us. Best of all, Jacqueline explains, accompaniment is something that all of us have the ability to do. We don't need prior experience. We don't need any set of credentials. We don't need any money. The power to accompany others is available to all of us. Practice 12, tell stories that matter. The moral leader, Jacqueline believes, also has the duty of being the storyteller. And stories, she goes further to say, have real consequences. I believe you become the story you choose to tell. The stories we tell as leaders in our respective circles have consequences consequences. Stories can define us. They can define our culture. Jacqueline calls for us as aspiring moral leaders to tell stories that inspire, unite, and offer up a vision for a better world that we can all aspire to. She argues that the optimistic, the driven, and the inspirational among us are people who are best at owning their own narrative. They seek out the positive and dig for an opportunity in the challenges that they and others face. She offers us a quote from the philosopher Plato, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. 
Moral leaders have both the duty and the opportunity to decide what's celebrated with the stories that they choose to tell. What story are you telling? In the final practice, practice 13, embrace the beautiful struggle. In her final practice, Jacqueline reminds us that the work of changing the world isn't easy. It's not quick either. <laughs> Sometimes our own personal goal might just be to sustain, hold on. Occasions of burnout, frustration, and feelings of overwhelm are all to be expected. So what do we do? For Jacqueline, she shares that her persistence has come from embracing what she calls the beauty in the struggle. She elaborates in saying, beauty inspires and motivates, beauty sustains. The key for each of us is to define what beauty means for us, to think of it not as superfluous, or indulgent, but as an essential part of what it means to be human. As we've all heard before, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What's beautiful to you? What's your vision for a better world that feels worth it? What beauty in the world do you wish there was more of? What we do and why we do it has to feel worth it so that in the times when we might feel challenged most, we can remind ourselves and then start again. All right, y'all, that's a wrap for this Read Ensemble video. I hope you enjoyed. We'll be back with another one soon. Of course, if you want to keep up with more of what I'm reading in real time as we explore the art of living and working sustainably, check out my weekly newsletter at growensemble.com backslash newsletter. And lastly, another reminder, if you do pick up a copy of Jacqueline's book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World, be sure to check out smaller booksellers like Bookshop.com. Org, Better World Books, or Best, your local indie bookstore.